let's talk about Jerry Sandusky. Now, Sandusky was convicted, obviously, of a number of child sex crimes. I think it was 45 out of 48 counts. Here's a man who was literally a man of the year kind of guy. He started a charity. He helped tens of thousands of kids. He did all sorts of great things for children, but he's convicted of actually molesting a bunch of kids. There are people who have, uh, well, one of them, his wife, has gone on the air saying that he's completely innocent and so forth. And there are other people that have sort of been promoting this idea, I think in, a, in a, an attempt to sort of protect Penn State. They think if Sandusky was innocent, then Penn State is innocent, and therefore everything will be honky-dory again. But I'm interested in what it, in, have, have you followed this case at all? Are you familiar with it? I did that? follow it. I did some television interviews. I was okay. on O'Reilly and a couple of shows about mm -hmm. it. And of course, at the time, uh, I'm a college football fanatic. Oh, I really? love college football. And I grew up on the East Coast, and I used to go to Army games growing up, where my father had been an All American and yeah. an assistant coach. And I used Army, to go to the Army Navy game all the time. Well, Army used to play Penn State all oh, the yeah. time. And, uh, and I always thought very highly of Joe Paterno, thought he was just a fabulous coach. Mm -hmm. um, I was hoping it wasn't true for that reason. You know, it seemed to me that uh, if this really was really happened the way the prosecutors were alleging it did, uh, this would be a real, real terrible blow to Penn State, to their football program, and to, to college football in general. And that, a, that a great coach would have allegedly and reportedly covered this up. Right. Uh, horrible, horrible. But not but, to mention, you know, if kids were being molested of course. by someone they looked up to because of his football prowess, that, uh, that's horrific. Right, but if you, but you're referring to what the sort of allegations were yes. out of, in the free report. Yes. And what's interesting about the free report is when Louis Free uh, actually released the report, he was asked about whether there was a conspiracy or anything like that. And he said, no, those are legal conclusions. These are reasonable conclusions. And to me, uh, I worked under Louis, and I think he's a very... Um, honest and forthright man. I think that was his honesty coming out because I think the conclusions that he drew, although they could be reasonable, were 100% wrong. I, because I believe that what Jerry was doing was hiding behind this nice guy acquaintance offender, the grooming of not only the victims but of the community. Everybody looked up to him. Everybody did. And if you look at Joe's, if you actually scrutinize Joe Paterno's statements, and by the way, I knew nothing of Joe Paterno before I did an investigation of this case. And because I, I didn't follow college football. And what I found was that his statements were such that he kept saying, even till the last statement one month before he died, if Jerry did what they're saying he did, then we all we should have done more. We, we, we all wish we would have done more. And he kept saying if because he was a believer in the system. He did believe that he, everybody needs the chance to be tried, not just in the court of public opinion, but that he felt like it's not possible because in his mind he knew Jerry. Even though he didn't necessarily like him as a friend, they didn't hang out, they didn't do any, any social things together other than travel during bowl games, but what he did was he said, this guy, I've seen him help kids, thousands of kids, tens of thousands of kids. I've never seen one kid come forward and say bad things about him. So when you, when you look at what Joe, Joe's perspective was, here's a man I know who's considered a saint by everybody, who's you know, a tactician at, at work. He's really successful. He doesn't have any of the sort of monster predator kind of things going on. They just simply didn't believe that it was true. Well, I don't think Joe Paterno ever believed child molestation was going on. And I, given the, the kind of character he had, the kind of values he taught, the kind of life he led, the kind of role model he was to young people, I refuse to believe that he had any real belief that child molestation was going on. I refuse to believe that he intentionally and consciously turned away from it. Uh, I, I just think he must have convinced himself based on everything he had heard, that this couldn't possibly be true. Well, and you've just given an explanation for why he probably believed it wasn't yeah. true. And it was just very tragic, you know, the way his career ended and the yeah, way his life was. ended at a school that he obviously loved. Yeah, and, and what was interesting, he, towards the end of his life, I found that he, he, he found out he had kept a legal pad on his desk, his night table, and apparently his family, uh, you know, after he, he went to the hospital for that last time, um, they looked, and the last thing he wrote was, hopefully, 
if anything good comes out of this whole mess, it'll be, it will be that people will learn more about this so it will never happen again. And that seems much more consistent with the Joe Paterno you describe rather than the Joe Paterno that was described in Louis Free's report. Again, I, I never met Joe, and I certainly never met Mr. Sandusky, and I'm not a witness to any of this, mm -hmm. but I had such respect for Joe Paterno. Uh, the way he conducted his career, he was loyal to Penn State. He could have gone to the pros. He didn't do that because he loved working with young people, and I think he was a man of character and integrity, and I just can't imagine that he thought this was going on. Yeah. I just can't believe it. Well, I tend to agree with you on that. Um, so... Let's, uh, let's move on to Michael Jackson. So obviously you, you have met Michael Jackson and you know a great deal about him. I, I understand that there's certain attorney-client privilege things that might be an issue, but he has, uh, he has definitely been um, probably, he's, he's probably one of the most famous people of all time. I mean, obviously he grew up in a time where the media was also growing and worldwide media grew and he actually became sort of the first star of the planet, right? Well, uh, let me be very candid with the viewers. Uh, you were an expert witness yeah. for the prosecution. Oh yeah, I was gonna go into that. Yeah. In, the, in his criminal case, you didn't testify, but you were on their witness list I and was. I was prepared to cross-examine you. Well, uh, I just, you wanna cross-examine me now? I don't need to do that now. <laughs> uh, he was vindicated. He was, uh, he was found not guilty on every single felony count and every single misdemeanor count. Ten felonies, four lesser included misdemeanors, very conservative jury in a very conservative community with a very high conviction rate, and they exonerated him just across the board. So uh, I think that speaks volumes. Uh, I know you were going to testify as an education expert. Yes, you were I not going to testify to the facts. No, I was going to testify as an expert and in you the were... area of uh, grooming and sex offender typologies and, excuse me, compliant victimization. So it, it was what the purpose of my testimony would have been, not to, uh, you know, bolster any witness or refute any witness, but to actually just educate the jury about particular aspects of child sexual victimization that may not be within the can of the average juror. And I would have cross-examined you on how often experts like yourself have been wrong. And I would have cited the McMartin case, the Bakersfield well, case. I would, it would have gone on and on. Yeah, you would have talked about you, those cases that, that, you can't speculate. that deal with five-year-olds year and six-year-olds. Actually, all the studies, all the studies that talk about false allegations by, um, by children of, of child sex crimes, they, they, they're all very firmly in the area that they're typically during the course of a custody battle or children under five or under. And those are where the actual documented studies, excuse me, cases of um, false allegations have come in. Once children get past that age, they're socialized much more in school and they're able to actually tell the difference between fantasy and reality. But you know as well as I do from practical experience, a 13-year-old will lie much more than a 5-year-old. Well, it depends on the situation. In fact, because 11, 12, 13, they can lie repeatedly. They can, but very rarely do they lie about being sexually victimized by a man. A male victim who is victimized by a man is much less likely to say that in public or any other circumstance. You know, you've seen the, like the John Jay study in the Catholic Church cases. I mean, the average time it took that adults to come forward was 20 years, and 25% of them didn't come forward till 30 years later. It's a very, very difficult thing. I mean, I myself, and I've been very open about this, I was victimized as a kid, and, and I, wouldn't, I was planning on never telling anybody, but when my brother approached me 10 years later and said, we should do something about that camp director, that's when I found out that there were other victims, I said, oh, well, I need to do something about it because I was prepared to just keep my silence forever. It just, I was embarrassed, I felt shameful, I felt like it was my fault or something was wrong with me, and these are things, the common things that victim experience. And I'm not saying, I know, and I'm never, I would never even want to try to get you to say that Michael Jackson is guilty or a bad person. I would never fact, say either. I know you, I never thought you I, would. He was a wonderful person and he was completely innocent of these well, horrible allegations. And, and they are horrible allegations, but the fa what I was talking about, what I'm talking about now, is not that he wasn't a wonderful person because there are definitely 
people who are wonderful people who also are sexually attracted to children. And if Michael was a pedophile, it, he was a loving pedophile, and that's a category of offenders who, who literally love children. They also fall in love with children, and that's where they cross the line. And again, I think Jerry Sandusky is a perfect example of that. He did not beat these children. He did not, you know, take out knives and guns and threaten them that way. What he did was groom them. He took his position of authority, his position of, well, being associated with Penn State and the football team, and use that to have kids look up to him. And he used that position of power to manipulate them. If so, you had seen the cross-examination of these accusers in Michael Jackson's criminal trial, you would 100% agree with me. Well, this guy was innocent. These accusers were absolutely ridiculous. They told so many different stories well, on so many different occasions. But none of that is inconsistent with victimization. They went to lawyers before they went to the police. There were so many problems they with, were with their motives. All right. Well, all no, their mother, was, their mother was with them most I know, of the time. I get that. Their father well, so was with them most of the time. they weren't the ones, right. They're, they weren't the ones that decided to go to a lawyer versus a prosecutor. And they had made allegations cop. about each other on other occasions. The kids had accused the father. The one kid had accused the mother. This was a family that, in my opinion, based on the information I got and which I used in cross-examining them, were very, very facile and free with allegations of abuse. I, I get it. And, and I'll, all I'll say to that is that it's not, it's not unusual for a child to lie about the fact that they were victim, victimized. It's not unusual for a child to, in fact, deny when the cops come knocking on the door. In fact, everyone but for one of the victims that testified, eight, seven out of the eight victims that testified in the Sandusky case, the cops approached them and asked them, and they said no. They denied it repeatedly, and then eventually they came forward and said it. And there was eventually enough weight that they went forward with the prosecution. All I'm saying is, I'm not trying, to, again, I'm not trying to get you to say that. I wouldn't do that as a person. But what I'm saying is that a lot of what you're talking about as inconsistencies on the part of the victims, um, wonderful traits on the part of Michael Jackson, He's a great father. There are plenty of great fathers who also do bad things. All I'm saying is the whole field of compliant victimization, the whole, the, the, the just incredibly insidious behavior that happens with grooming and manipulation of children who are actually victimized, it becomes this sort of whole conspiracy of silence. But if you are Michael Jackson and you were signing contracts at five years of age, and you were supporting a family at five and six and seven years of age. You were rehearsing till three in the morning while you were going to grammar school, getting up at six and seven. You were working on weekends and you had no childhood and you became a tremendous genius, a tremendous success, mm -hmm. and you had an opportunity to try and do what you could do for children around the world. You used to visit a hospital on every singing engagement, every entertainment engagement. Wherever he was, he would visit hospitals for disabled children. He built Neverland because he wanted to see inner city kids and, and children with problems have fun. Absolutely. If you do this and you're Michael Jackson, you are also a big target for false allegations. And I don't think till that criminal trial Michael ever fully appreciated that people were targeting him for his money, they were targeting him for his fame, because he was visible, he was perceived as wealthy, and he was perceived as sensitive and vulnerable and kind and nice, which right, he was. But also, I mean, even if they didn't, if Bashir didn't show all of the interactions that he actually videotaped, he did show the interactions between Michael and that child. And it is, it is a very telling set of behaviors when a child, an unrelated child, is that um, affectionate with a, an adult who is not related to them. And, and what Bashir put, did not put in his documentary were interviews with Michael Jackson where he said he would slit his wrists before he would hurt no, a child. No, that and that's never the thing. do anything improper. And, and that actually, and I know exactly what you're saying, except that nobody ever said Michael hurt a child. They said Michael had sex with a child, and well, well anyone it, knows that. Well, that's, except that's, that, except that those are very specific terms that he used. But the fact is that I mean, I know you called Wade Robeson as your first witness, and I did. and he's now saying that it happened. He's saying it much later in life when he was interviewed about why he flip flopped, why he now came around and said Michael did this to him. He said that you know, I mean, he's a father now, right? He's actually in a position where he sees 
that he he felt like he had to be honest eventually. Well, I interviewed Robson mm -hmm. before I decided to call him as a witness. And as you know, when you put on a defense case, which you don't have to do, the defense can simply rely on cross-examination sure. of the prosecution's witnesses um, if the defense chooses to. But if you're going to put on a defense case, you want to start strong and you want to end strong. Right. I began with Wade Robson because he was such a powerful witness for Michael Jackson. He was adamant that no improper behavior ever went on, that he was never abused, never touched sexually. His mother and his sister also testified. I called them as witnesses as well because they traveled with Wade and Michael. And to flip-flop, not just the way he has, but when he has, years after Michael has passed away because he sees a big, fat, juicy, well, lucrative estate, I'm very, very okay, troubled. I, I get you're skeptical about it, but two things. One is, clearly, the, the Jacksons sued a very lucrative company to get money because they felt aggrieved, so it's not wrong for somebody to do that. And two is... If you this, really feel aggrieved. Right. And, and two is... I that, don't think he does. Well... You, I know you don't think so, but he clearly wouldn't, knowing what he had done, getting on the stand, testifying that way, it must have taken a lot for him to come forward and say that. He knows what he's going up against. He, he faced aggressive cross-examination by a skilled prosecutor, Ron Zonin, and he would not budge one inch. He said, it's ridiculous what you're suggesting. It is, but he came back to that same prosecutor and said it happened so more recently. So, unfortunately, we're out of time, but I really appreciate you coming, Tom, and thank you so much Thanks for, for having me. this appreciate really it. great debate. Thank you. Well, everybody, tell us what you think and uh, subscribe to Lip TV. Take care until next time. Bye. <laughs>